Full CG compositing is done by both 3D and lighting department. In lighting department, they create passage for the compositor to create in a similar shot or an image. CG compositing is usually layering all the passes done by the lighting department mostly. This week I had an opportunity to have a workshop session with Jay Stanner, who has been in the industry for more than 15 years, worked on numerous TV shows, animation and feature films in various companies. He also wrote for films and TV shows and directed his own short films. In this session, you will learn how to layer all the passes and create a comp from start to finish. Let us learn the art of CG compositing and this session going to have a lot of valuable information and make sure to take some notes of it. Let's get started. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the session. So uh, this session is about uh, CG VFX Mate. It mainly focuses to create a bridge between a professional artist and, and to the people who want to know about the VFX industry and who wants to learn from uh, VFX professionals. So this is happening around 7.30 p.m. on every Thursday. It is Everyone is welcome for this session. So today we're going to talk about uh, the art of CG compositing. So today we have uh, Jay Stainus, who has been in this industry for more than 15 years, worked on numerous TV shows, animation and feature films in uh, various companies. He also a scriptwriter. He also wrote for uh, films and TV shows. Currently, he is working as a lead compositor in a company located in Toronto. So it's very exciting to welcoming Jay. And Jay, it's all on you now. All right. Thank you, Becky. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of people that responded to the initial post thinking they were going to see me do composting, which is why I put this background up. Uh, I, fig I figure hats off to anybody who would want to spend their Thursday night watching me shovel horse manure. But uh, no, actually, it's digital compositing, which I, is what I do. And uh, in essence, I think, Becky, you sort of covered it, but it's sort of um, in production, a compositor is sort of the last person to touch the shot. Uh, and we take all the elements that are created by other artists before us, uh, and that's that could be modelers, uh, people texturing those models, uh, people creating uh, matte paintings in the background, um, layout artists, positioning cameras. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Uh, and then ultimately uh, comes down to lighting. We have actually specific lighting artists who will set up lights uh, in the CG environment and then they will um, render out other elements and then that's where I get it. So I get stuff uh, down the line and uh, my job is to pull stuff out of the fire and fix everybody else's mistakes and screw-ups. <laughs> no, not just kidding. Uh, usually, it's, usually it's pretty good stuff and uh, I sort of put everything together. So why don't I start by sharing my screen so, uh, for starters, let's just talk about the software that I'm using. It's, uh, this is Nuke, which is pretty standard in the industry. Um, I think almost everybody to one degree or another is using Nuke. This is Nuke 12.2 version three. It's actually Nuke non-commercial. You can actually go to the Nuke site and get yourself a non-commercial free version, as long as you're not making million dollar uh, commercials with it and there are some limitations um, but it's a great uh, it's a great way to practice if you're interested in getting into this and uh, I even made a short film a couple of years ago and I, I did a lot of compositing work and a lot of stuff on Nuke so that's currently what we're looking at um, I'll just show you the geography of it a little bit this is if you haven't figured out this is the viewer you're in deep trouble but uh, this is the viewer here um, here we have our flow and workspace. Okay, so I would bring in all my footage. I would do add color corrects, the focuses, you name it. All that stuff is down down here, uh, and then over here, while I'm wiggling my cursor, yeah, right over here, this is uh, the properties of what I'm clicking on. So let's see if I'm clicking on this, you can see it shows you the path to my renders. Uh, if I have a color correction tool, uh, I would do all my adjustments and everything over here um, on the final to, to create the final shot. Um, so I just want to talk first of all that there are generally three different types of composites. 
uh, when we're putting all the elements together in a shot. Um, so here's a classic example, Pulp Fiction, of a shot where there's really no CGI elements. Uh, this is, I believe this was probably um, an insert of a background. And this is the classic sort of the situation where they would have a blue or green screen behind the actors and they would strip that away and they would put it in a background. So there's really, this is just taking actual live action elements and putting them together. Um, another type of compositing uh, from Alien Resurrection, I think that's what that's from, would be something like this, where they're taking an actual 3D element, uh, in this case, creature, and placing it, compositing it into an actual uh, live action environment. Presumably they filmed this underwater and then they would have uh, CG artists that would build the models, texture them as I previously talked about, light them so that they're lit to look like they should be in the environment. And then the comp artist would put them into that environment. And thirdly, we have an entirely CG environment, Toy Story, um, which is a unique sort of thing to not have any live action elements, at least for me, but this would be an example of everything is computer generated. And that's more or less what we're working with today. Although I think there's some live action elements uh, in our final shot. So for sure, I think this fire here uh, is absolutely uh, real uh, live action. So maybe, maybe we're doing something somewhere between Alien Resurrection and Toy Story. But um, so anyway, let me move down from this. Dinesh has provided me with some elements that I'll be putting together today. So we've got a sky element. Uh, we've got buildings. I believe that these are generated uh, in 3D. We've got a mid-ground element. Uh, we've got this character here who animates forward in the scene. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So he's an animated character. Uh, as well, I've got some various elements. I've got a smoke element that I'm going to be introducing. Uh, yep, there's the fire element. Again, we'll be bringing that in. So uh, this certainly would not do as a final cut. This is me just slapping the elements together. Um, but this is just that, kind of to give you an idea. And there's... AJ, oh, um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so... The elements you were talking about, so usually like, you know, studio provides it or you guys have like a built-in library in the studio or how it works. Yep, absolutely. Yes. Uh, in some cases, we can have things created. Uh, certain effects could be fire, could be sparks that would be created by an effects artist, would be, could be uh, computer generated. Um, or in other cases, we yeah, we have a library. And there might be a library that has smokes, might have fire, uh, fog, uh, blood splurts, you name it. So um, many times a shot is a combination of all these things. And so we may need to source those things and bring them into the shot. It very much looks like uh, this fog layer was probably filmed somewhere. It looks legit. Um, and uh, certainly the fire as well. Uh, one thing to talk about here is how do we put these things together? Well, something that's key is, yeah, these are RGB elements for sure. There's a red, green, and blue channel, but as well, there's something called an alpha channel, okay? So the alpha basically gives a solid backing to the RGB. So almost think of it like this is a sticker. This is the solid backing, and anything that's black Think of it as like glass or something that's invisible. So what that enables me to do is to take that and put it on top of that, okay? Um, and we would merge it, we get a merge tool here. If that alpha channel had some gray in it, then the gray would in fact be sort of transparent, okay? It could be, a, it, it would be in between completely invisible and solid. Um, and another way to play around with opacity with a comp is actually within the merge tool here. You can see that this is piped into, this is the A side, this is on top, this is the B side. And if I fool around with this, see, I'm kind of uh, decreasing the opacity. So you can decrease opacity there as well. So uh, anyway, that's just the very basics of the elements. But what I did was I took Dinesh's elements 
and I decided to push and pull and do some interesting things, hopefully with them. So we're going to start off, we're going to, we're going to stack this. It's almost like working in Photoshop. So we're going to start from the back and we're going to work our way forward to the final product. So as you can see, we have the sky here. I thought the sky was maybe a little too purple, a little too red. So what I did was I opened up, put a color correction tool here. You can see it right here. And if we view that, see, so I've kind of dropped out some of that red, made it a little more green. I can go really green with it by sliding it there. Uh, I think I'm kind of happy like that. Hey, Jay. And, uh, yo. So how did you bring those notes, like the color correct notes on all the notes, uh, bring it in? How do you usually like bring it? Oh, okay. So there's very different. There's the, the, two, the quick hotkey ways. I press tab and then I hit key C and then that's going to give me my color correct right there. And so I could just, you know, there's, there's, mo there's many different ways. Uh, I have, boy, I haven't done this in ages, but uh, I believe through here as well, you can find the, the various nodes. Um, there's also mat tools and things of that nature. If I wanted to pull a key, uh, key here. Uh, and for those who don't know, a key is basically just a way of taking the RGB values and whatever the brightest values are, I end up making an alpha channel. So I can create an alpha channel. So if you look at that, and then what I can do is if I crank these things like, like so, Whatever is whitest is going to be more solid. Whatever's gray is going to be sort of transparent somewhat. Whatever's black is going to be completely transparent. Um, so yeah, so this is how I can bring these things in. Uh, if I want to bring in footage, I can bring in uh, footage here. Whoop, take that, okay. So that's just different ways of, of, of bringing things in. Um, so anyway, that's the alpha channel that I talked about. I've added a little bit of the focus uh, to the shot. Now, it's a pretty wide shot if you look at it with the camera. So generally, the focus on a shot like that is going to be pretty deep. But I'm just going to push it and exaggerate it a little bit um, just to show, just to give a little more emphasis to depth and what's going on back there. So I've got my sky. Uh, oh, you know, one other thing I was thinking about, actually. I'm going to bring in a tool, grid warp. Okay, uh, that is size to the image. Um, the sky, I kind of want to give a little bit of life to this. So what I want to do is put a little bit of movement in those clouds. So what I'm going to do is, this is a tool that basically will, as you can see, move and shift stuff around a bit. And the minute that I make a movement, it puts a keyframe down here in my timeline, okay? So that means it's gonna remember that move. So I'm gonna put my key at the beginning. Maybe I'll just put an ever so slight move here. And then if I go to the end of the shot, I'm just gonna slide it a little bit, maybe move some of this stuff up here. Little this, little that. Bob's your uncle. There we go. All right. So start there, right there. So when we end up copying this, putting it together, um, it'll be subtle, kind of like a clock moving. It's not real forceful, but there's a little bit of sense of that cloud activity moving around. Okay. So let's see. So we're going to put the buildings in now. Okay. So initially when I looked at the buildings, Let's open up this one. Uh, yeah, I thought they looked a little too warm, a little too red, so I want to cool it down. It's nighttime. So I'm just going to add a little color correct there just to bring it down a little bit. Now, the one thing that I thought was really odd was this brightness back here. It, uh, it just seemed to not really work, I thought. So I want to just sort of isolate more in this area and bring this brightness down. Okay. So what I did was, there's many different ways to skin a cat, but I created an alpha channel. Use this luminance. It's going to take the RGB values, and it's going to give me an alpha channel. Okay? So as you can see, the alpha channel is at its thickest. It's more solid where it's bright. So what I can do with that alpha channel now is I can actually pipe it in to another color correct as a mask. So this color correct will only affect the whitest areas and to some degree the gray areas. So, let's see, you can see 
that's what it was. That's what it is. So it's sort of a, a cheap, easy, dirty way to sort of um, to isolate that area and to uh, bring some of that light down. How's that looking now? I think that looks a little more realistic. Uh, so next, I discovered this interesting map. Because if you look at these buildings, there's really nothing on these um, aerials that would suggest lights or anything. But I see that we've got a uh, ID pass is essentially what this is. This is just made up of basic, you know, it's red, green, blue. And I notice, oh, look at these little things here. Maybe I can use those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate these red dots, okay? And I'm going to turn them into mats, okay? So here's another alpha channel. So I'm going to take that alpha channel and I'm going to pump it into, get ready to cover your eyes. Uh, I'm going to cover it, in, I'm going to pump it into this red solid mass, okay? So this alpha channel into this, and what we're going to get, voila, little red lights, okay? Get a little bit of glow to that. What's that look like? A little bit. All right, so now we got little red lights attached. You don't look very attached. Oh, well. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. That's our, that's our out right there. And uh, I wonder if this is moving. Is that the problem? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they're moving. Yeah, that's why. Because I basically have frozen the scene. Okay. So anyway, um, I'm looking at this background, and uh, I'm thinking, hmm. You notice that our background is in the XR file. So you remember how I've talked about how uh, it's really important that everything be rendered to us in layers, right? It's much better to get the background separate, the midground separate, the main character separate. Because if the artist before me were to just put everything in the one file and serve it up, uh, that could take days to render. And if one little thing needed to be fixed or changed, oh my God, then it's back to rendering. So it really it's, it's, makes a lot more sense. It's much more streamlined to break things down as much as possible. So that's why we have all these different levels. But within a level, we can also have included extra levels. This is an EXR file. So looking in here, I look at this and I'm like, oh, look at that. You know what that is? That's a depth mat. That basically, because this was created with a computer or shot with a camera in the computer, this is giving us information in terms of a grayscale. Uh, the brightest, thickest areas are further back and the darker areas are closer to us. So what I can do is I can actually end up extracting a map from that, okay? That's actually the, the actual mat is there. Sorry, yes. Okay, I gotta press A. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to apply to that. Hey Jay, uh, I have a question. Yeah. So how, how did you extract a uh, mat, a uh, depth mat from the EXO file? So what I did was, well, they're not they're not named, but I ended up discovering that in fact it is a depth now. Becky, if you're looking at this shuffle note and it looks weird to you, it looks weird to me too. This is the very latest uh, nuke, so I had to kind of figure this one out. But yeah. essentially what I did was I was able to, using a shuffle node, um, extract out in an alpha channel these colors, okay? And then using a color correct tool. So the BG layer, what you're getting from uh, lighting, so yeah. it's combined with all the pauses. That's right. If we go back and if we look at the the contact sheet, the contact sheet essentially shows us everything that lies inside this uh, EXR. So, uh, thanks, Jay. So could you explain now uh, what are these processes are? What the processes are? Like the uh, the layers, what you got from lighting. Oh, okay. Again, usually they're labeled. These ones aren't. So many times we will get... Um, let me give you another example. Yep something that's going to be a little more obvious. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at the creature and or the uh, little mechanical man. 
So basically, this would be everything combined together. Okay, if you just wanted to take it right out of the box, and this is what's known as the beauty pass. Yeah. Uh, I think perhaps this is a depth pass, not 100%. It looks like it, so kind of like that other red pass we used. Uh, this would be an ID pass, so I could actually select one of these colors, make a mat out of it, so that I could only affect, if I just affect the green part, it'll only affect this part of his body, okay? So these are ID passes. Uh, this clearly looks like a reflection or spec pass, okay? Let me bring him up more in the frame. Um, so what I could do is I can combine all of these things. It gives me, again, a little more versatility. This is a shadow pass. This is a diffuse layer pass. Uh, and this is a basic color pass. If this had no, if this had no shadow or anything on it at all, if this was, um, if it was just straight color, that's what it would look like. Okay. So again, it just gives us a little more versatility, uh, in regards to being able to put this together. Okay. Oh. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Jay, uh, one more question. Could you explain like uh, why we are getting uh, all these uh, passes uh, for comp uh, instead of uh, getting one single layer? Well, it's uh, essentially it's broken out in lighting, is it not? Am I getting that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, it'll, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, it's actually it's in, within the lighting passes when they put this thing together, they are able to spit out not just the final image, but within an EXR file, they're able to spit out all the little processes that go in to making that image. So again, it just it just gives us more versatility so that we can build it up, make whatever changes we want to make so that we're not just, um, I'm not just stuck with that and then having to color correct that, right? It just gives me much more yeah. versatility, right? Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, yeah. So what I did, where were we? Oh, yes. I created, using some thick, some color, I created a, let me turn up the gamma here. I created a pass of just kind of grayness. And then what I did was I placed it on top of our background, but I placed it there. Okay, I guess the opacity is up on that. Just like that. So you can see um, there's virtually no change to this because this is closer to us. But buildings like this one, like this one, further back, they're a little more grayed out, which I suppose is what you would call aerial perspective. Uh, so a little darker, a little grayer. So again, it just helps us to create uh, the illusion of depth. Um, so I'm going to put these things together. Uh, feels a little too crisp to me. Feels a little too CG. So the last thing I did was I add a little bit of defocus. Again, it's probably a little too much to focus because on a wide angle shot like this, I don't know, your focus goes a pretty far away, but I'm just going to uh, amp it up a little bit uh, just for these purposes. So that basically accounts for our background. Now there's some other goodies along the way down our tree, our comp tree that I won't quite get into yet. But the next thing I want to look at is the midground. Okay. Well, let's just put the midground on. So uh, this is basically essentially what I'm getting out of here. Um, with this, it feels to me a little bit too separate from the background. So the, the, the thing we really want to do is try to marry things and make it look like they exist uh, within the same, uh, as if everything was filmed for real uh, with a real camera. So. This feels a little bit, a bit uh, separate to me. So I discovered that, oh, lo and behold, we have, I think we talked about this before, an ID map. So what I can do is I can break out these different areas and I can combine, I can essentially create alpha channels out of them, which is what I've done here. Uh, so I've got my BG, I've got my blue, which is my midground. And my foreground is the red, although it's not completely consistent. You can see that this is more or less lining up with the stuff back here. But just to keep things simple, that's what I've called it for now. So let's see, what did I do? So I created a mat. So that's just these parts here. And what I'm doing is I'm going to channel this mat into a color correct. So the color correct, you can see, we can play with it here. So if I look at that, 
can adjust it back and forth so I've got some control there, okay? So I've done the same thing with my mid-ground. I didn't do a whole lot with that. What am I going to do? Oopsie. You can really exaggerate it. That would not look good. Uh, yeah, so maybe a little bit there. And then my foreground elements, those red things in there, all that red stuff. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so again, just very small tweaks. And if we look at our final out, right. So it still looks a little bright to me. So what did I do? Oh, I know. Added a bit of saturation. You know what? I might down the gamma on this as well. That's too much. Uh, yeah, just a little bit, just a small tweak. And again, the great thing is because we're doing this in layers, I can defocus this and I don't have to worry about defocusing anything behind it. So I'll add a little bit of defocus to this, certainly less than what I applied to the background there. So what do we, right now we're just sort of hitting the main parts. We've got the background, we've got the mid-ground. Uh, anybody have any questions so far? All right, I'll take your silence as meaning that you are understanding. So, next up. Okay, so this is our character, starts off Low in the shot, right? Animates like that. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit earlier, but it's worth looking at again. Uh, he's made up of many different parts. And so rather than just trying to do a one color correct on this, I'd like to color correct each of the little parts. So this is sort of a microcosm of the larger comp, right? It's still, it's made up of many different little pieces. So, First part was the diffuse layer. Uh, I'm going to darken that down. So again, I've added a color correct. You can see I've dropped the gamut down here. If you want to look at that, that's what it looks like. If you want to look at the final, what it looks like compared to the background. Oh, I know what I did wrong. These guys are pumping through the alpha. There we go. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a little better, I think, in terms of the color. I've got another shuffle tool here. That, I believe, is a reflection layer. So I'm going to additively add that on, okay? Um, building it up bit by bit. This one, I believe, is a shadow layer. Whoops. Okay. So uh, I'm going to assume there's multiple different ways to use this. Uh, I just did a quick and dirty way, which is where you can see wherever the brightest parts on this is where the shadows, in fact, should go. So what I've done is I've used a luminance key right here. And I can manipulate it. If we take a look inside the luminance key, there's our alpha. So I've now created an alpha like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this alpha, the brightest parts, which are most solid, to darken down the character. Okay. So there it is on. There it is off. Uh, I can adjust it there. If I want, I can maybe add a little bit of red or a little bit of blue into the shadow or what have you. Okay. So again, I'm using that, whoops, I'm using that to create my shadows or to at least embellish my shadows. Uh, next thing I just, at that point, I felt like adding a color correction tool just to, again, kind of make things a little bit darker, a little bit blue. Uh, and then, oh, I think this one's going to be juicy. Yeah, that's the, uh, the reflection, okay? And reflection, spec pass, it's the brightest parts. Uh, I want to do a little tweak on the color of that. I've actually upped the saturation of it. I just kind of want to make things pop. And then I've added it onto our guy here additively. You can see within the tool that I have this slider, if I wanted to turn it off, I could go like that, or I could put it full on. Uh, I don't want it full on. But I think I'm happy with having it, uh, yeah, around there. So let's see what it looks like thus far. Okay. So the other thing I discovered with this was that it had an ID pass, right? So this one would be for the arms, kind of like what we did with the mid crown. Okay. So there's our ID pass. I only want to affect the arms. So I pulled it. 
basically I removed the arms, then I inverted the mat. And if we look, there's our mat. Oops, I got this ugly line here, so I'm going to erode the mat. There we go. So that's basically what I want. So now what I can do is I can use this alpha and I can just affect his arm. See that? Okay. Uh, I didn't really want to do anything to the body. I did the same thing with the head. The head was, if you remember, was the blue uh, ID mat. And if you look here, so again, I can play around with that. So it just gives a little bit of variance. Uh, really, really helpful having these ID mats. It really helps the comp artist to, uh, in some cases, designate an area of the model. Sometimes you might get a note from the client that they just want a specific part of something changed or darkened down or whatever. So uh, again, versatility is the name of the game. Uh, so you want to be able to have access to all those things as opposed to, again, just getting it as one clumpy thing and then trying to uh, fix things from there which would be way too time consuming and painful. Um, so here's our guy. Now, uh, what's interesting, I thought is, okay, he starts off in the background and then he moves up into the foreground. I'd like him to look a little more dis diminished when he's in the background. So now I'm gonna animate a color correct, okay? So what I did was I made a keyframe right there you can see that i've moved that i can if i move it right so i'm kind of darkening him down if you look at the viewer and then what i did was as he got bigger in the viewer i basically uh gained up so i brought him back into his natural color okay so again uh getting dark dark at first progressively getting lighter uh it's subtle it's not a major thing um added as well a little softening to him um problem with cg elements is sometimes it can look a little too obviously cgi computer generated so this takes some of the curse off of that just softened him up a little bit i thought his edges were possibly a little too hard so i've used an edge blur as well just to soften that just a little bit and so there he is in the shot now, uh, I've been given some other elements, too, that make this interesting, sort of tie stuff together. And one of the elements is this one, smoke element, okay? Now, this, I don't believe, is a CGI element, computer generated. This was, no doubt, filmed somewhere uh, against a black screen to make it easier to pull a mat. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to layer the smoke behind, so we see our friend is here, but I'm going to tuck him in just in behind there, okay? So what did I do? I add a little bit of color. Right, okay? So what I did was I actually put a little bit of orange in there because I want to give a sense of some fire. And I've tucked him in, I've tucked, sorry, I've tucked the smoke in behind our character, uh, which is fine for there. But you know what? When he's back here, I kind of want him to look like he's in the smoke so that he's in the smoke and coming out of it. So there's many different ways to do this. But uh, what I decided to do was I took his alpha, right? Remember, he's got an alpha channel. And I took this exact same smoke level. And what I did was I combined them, okay? So now what we're going to get is we're going to get an alpha the alpha is only showing that smoke, right? You can see as he comes up, it's only within the smoke. So now if I apply this back over him, it's not going to double up the smoke that there. It's only going to be on him. So what I've done is, again, I've got an animation this time of the opacity. So I have the smoke on him pretty heavy at the beginning of the shot. And then what I do is I animate it. So I make a key point at frame 7 to frame 65. I completely dissipate it. And between these frames, if you look, if you look at the number here, you can see that it's, it's in fact animated, that it is slowly, slowly, slowly starting to become transparent. Okay? So that's kind of one quick and easy way of having the character um, obscured by smoke and then bringing him forward. 
So now we're going to go back a little bit into the comp. There's some stuff that I skipped over. Uh, I think we wanted to put fire in here. So I discovered some fire elements. Actually, Dinesh pointed me to them. Um, yeah. So this is something that we might have gotten from a library or whatever uh, and put into the shot. Now, when I just play it like that, that's a little too fast for me, right? I don't quite like that. So what I'm able to do is actually filter and change the time. So I use, in the case of Nuke, I use what is known as an O-Flow tool. And I've got this set to an out output speed of half, okay? One would be regular speed. Two would be double the speed. 0.5, that's half the speed. So I'm going to slow it up a little bit. Um, I'm going to use a luminance because I want to put it over something. So I'm going to create a mat like that. Uh, and then ultimately what I'm going to do is place this fire into my scene, right? Looks looks kind of absurd there, like it's just kind of hanging there for no reason, but makes more sense when I put the mid-ground element over it, okay? Uh, as well, I have another fire element. I thought I'd add two, why not? So this one I have moved up in the timeline because it didn't quite start where I wanted it to. So I gave it an offset. If you look over here, minus 500. And basically did the same stuff that I did over there. Pulled uh, a luminance of it, uh, transformed it. But you know what? I want this to look bigger. I want it to be a longer strip of fire. So I took the exact same fire, but I changed the time offset. I put it to a different time frame done the same thing, added it together. So now what we have is a little more fire combined together. What's that look like? Add a little bit of the focus too, just to be consistent. Okay, so I got some fire there, right? So then I thought, hmm, fire so close to these rocks, but not affecting these rocks in any way. So I want to try and make it look like this has some effect on the environment. So again, this is done very, very quick. But what I did was I took that fire element, let's see, right there. I used a transform node to blow it up. And then I used a blur node. And I just blurred the crap out of it. So basically, it's going to move exactly as the fire moves, but it's just going to be more of a larger sort of uh, sense of color. And then I only wanted to hit it. I only want the light to hit the, these elements in the in the in the midground. So remember, we have the remember we have these keys here, or sorry, we have these mats that I've created from the original ID mat. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to combine. I'm going to combine this into this, right? To get that nice orange light. And then I'm going to add it to my rocks. Yeah. See, they're off. Now this could be done. I could spend more time in this. I could cut out mats. I could maintain these shadows and stuff, but uh, just a very quick example. Um, and I did the same thing on the other side as well. Again, channeling it through the mats, right? If I turn those off. You can see that having some effect uh, on the background. Um, let me see. Let me see. What do we have here? Oh, we've got more smoke. So with this one, again, pull some luminance, add a little color into it, a little bit of red. Sometimes I have to do forensics work on my own shot to know what the hell is I thinking. Okay. So I'm just kind of putting that as a basic sort of uh, fill of smoke in the background. Yeah, I think that kind of works. It kind of ties everything together. Um, and as well, I wanted to put some smoke. Let's take a look at what I did here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to put a little bit of smoke, a little bit, a bit of uh, coming from over here, as if there was maybe some fire raging on that side of the screen or whatever. So again, I took the exact same smoke, but just so it doesn't look like I'm duplicating things completely, I did a little bit of a time set on it. I mirrored the smoke. Okay, so that means it reverses its its uh, position, and again with a color correction, 
add a little bit of this time i took the orange out of it i made it a little more neutral uh and i added it into the scene um okay let me see yes two more things okay so as well another little thing i discovered now i'm pretty sure this was made in a cg environment now what the hell is that i thought well it looks like embers i think those are embers just kind of floating around in the fire i thought okay very cool so yep, there's our alpha channel so what i've decided to do is in fact add a little color with a color correction tool upping the gain make them kind of orange give them a little bit of glow see my glow node here uh, i can affect the size of the glow uh, i can affect, affect the brightness what have you and then what i thought hmm as these things go up they do kind of die out so now what i've created is a garbage mat okay so if we look at this right so i've got some fall off this is a mat and what i'm going to do is i'm going to use this mat to essentially kill these things as they travel up into it okay so here's what they look like before Right? So you can see they're kind of getting dimmer as, as embers or sparks might do. And I thought, well, geez, since I've got this mat here, why don't I change the color of them as well? So I'm going to use the exact same alpha channel mat, and I'm going to add a little bit of red into them. So not only dying off, but they're going, you can see I've made the color correction here. They're going from more of an orange to a red sort of color. Uh, and initially, I put these over my scene. here yeah and i thought oh shit you know when i played this out some of these embers were falling in front of him and i thought mm, you know what i'd really rather have them behind him now i could just layer it in on the cop tree i could just make sure that this node instead goes up here so it's going in behind him but as they say there's more than one way to skin a cat so what i actually did was i took him his alpha channel and i Using this node and out node, I basically cut out the embers, okay? So you can see here's the embers before I cut them out, and here they are actually being cut out by his body. And then what I can do is add them on here, okay? And one last bit of smoke because I thought, boy, you know what? He still feels kind of separate to me, and I kind of want to really make stuff look like it's, you know, actually – all cohesively in the same environment. So this is just me taking, get another smoke layer. Uh, this time I've reversed it the other way. You can see over here, I did a horizontal flop, add some sort of fire color to it, placed it right over him. Um, so just about done. And I thought, you know, one thing of course that it's missing in the CG world because we film this stuff with CGI cameras uh, is film grain. Right? Typically, when you see something filmed with a, with a real camera, it's got a degree of grain in it. So we can even add grain to the shot. So there's my grain tool there. I'll just throw it up in the viewer. Right Now, this is probably very aggressive, but I've just done this again just to kind of show you guys uh, what it looks like. Uh, oh, turn that on. Make too much overhang there. Um, yeah. And so that is the final comp. I did a render. Okay. So I'll just do a quick flip book of this. Um, Renders relatively quick. These are low uh, low size of files. Many times we work with 2K or 4K uh, file size. So even for my gaming computer, this seems to be working fine. Yeah. So that's my final comp. Very basic, very rudimentary, but I, hopefully it gives you uh, sort of an idea of the way things work. Uh, in a uh, in a compositor's script and using CGI uh, elements.
Awesome, Jay. That looks really cool. So, uh, just have a question. Um, yeah. So, uh, what's the difference uh, between like uh, CG, like completely CG compositing, and uh, VFX and CG uh, live compositing? Well, uh, the great advantage, if it's completely CGI, uh, is that you get lots of stuff for free. You get it was it, you get all the information from the camera that was created. Uh, in the scene, here's something that's fully CGI. Uh, these would all come with their own unique um, uh, alpha channels. Um, so you have a lot, uh, there's a lot that you can do within the shot because it's all generated in the computer. Uh, if you were to take a shot like this, um, typically, well, the reason why you see a green screen or a blue screen in a film is essentially to generate a mat. So what they would do is pull a mat and then put the background uh and then put the background in behind uh and this would be a combination again of uh an actual plate of footage it looks like it's filmed underwater um and then you know so this may come with its own challenges if there was something in the shot that went over them then we would have to create a a separate roto shape or a mat um for these guys uh this let me see what's this Right. Okay. So in this case, sometimes you've got to create your own mat too. Okay. Uh, that becomes much more laborious. If there wasn't a green screen there or a blue screen to strip it out, then what I have to do is go in with a rotoscope and frame by frame by frame, I'd have to uh, basically animate it to the face of John Travolta um, and cut him out of the scene that way in order to layer in something behind him. So certainly if, if you're in the world of complete CGI, uh, you really get all that stuff for free. So in many ways, it just makes it a much less uh, painful experience. Cool, cool. Uh, awesome. So, um, so, uh, so uh, like all CG compositing, uh, with everything is computer generated, so it comes with an alpha. Yeah. And uh, with the live and CG, uh, the CG book comes with an alpha. But um, <clears throat> when you see the uh, pauses that does uh, creating by the lighting artist, so what are the main uh, differences between the pauses that you will get it for uh, CG compositing and, and the live and CG compositing? Uh, well, the pass is like, kind of like what we were looking at before. Um, they're going to break it up, and, and, and the passes can be uh, – there we are. So the passes can be made up of many different uh, elements to make up the shot, everything from the alpha channel used in the shot, uh, and again, to um, typically what you're going to get, you're going to get a spec pass. Uh, typically, you're going to get a diffuse level. Typically, you're going to get a shadow pass. Uh, you may get a reflection layer. Uh, I think this is a depth mat, so you even get something so that you can play around with the depth, and with the depth mat, you can adjust the level of of the focus on an object, you can uh, you can use it as a color correction tool. Uh, you can make something that's far away look more gray and foggy, and then sort of you know using the values of the mat itself. As it gets closer to camera, uh, it would make it less opaque, I suppose, if you were putting some kind of smoky effect on the character. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, generally that's that's kind of like what we're getting rendered out. And again, if I were to film something, a live action, uh, some object in a sequence or whatever, of course, you don't get any of that. You, you, you get what you get, right? So it's a, it's a huge advantage of working in the CGI world. Okay, cool. Hey, Jay. Uh, sorry, NKJ. Uh, there's a question from the chat, like, uh, what is normal pass used for? What are normal passes used for? <laughs> <laughs> I've never used normal passes. Well, which is that? This one here? Yeah, yeah. I think that's why it's called normal, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah. normal. <laughs> okay, yeah, you tell me, Vanky, because I don't think I ever use the normals pass whenever I do a comp. Okay, uh, so the normal pass is uh, basically used to relighting uh, in comp. Yeah. So all these uh, RGB colors uh, that different that's describing the lighting. Uh, that's placed on in CG environment, like in the 3D software. Mm -hmm. So that each colors is describing in each light from the uh, lighting department. So in comp, we have the mat that we can rotate or we can relight the uh, uh, CG after okay. the lighting was done in comp. In in some scenarios, um, 
where the character is walking through uh, in in a real real and uh, CG environment when the character is walking through the uh, light, mm -hmm. but that's uh, in the real light. So that uh, if it is not being done in uh, CG, so in Compass have uh, options that they can add one more light when the character is pausing. So obviously, when you add any lighting, so all the shadows and other stuffs will get changed. So right. for that, so to relight, so we can uh, we have to use this uh, normal pass. So cool. that's the main use of normal pass. Ah, yeah. Good to know. I should start using that. <laughs> Uh, because uh, in real, real and uh, uh, CG, uh, so most of the uh, lightings has been uh, done in CG because they're using uh, like the HDR, I think. So all the lightings from the environment has already been added in, from the lighting. For sure. But, uh, whereas in uh, CG compositing, like completely yeah. CG, like uh, TV shows, cartoon shows, yeah. where you want to relight or something, that yeah, you can you can do it later. Right. Yeah. Right, right. So th that's that's the normal bus. Mm. Okay. Cool, Jay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Jay, uh, in your yeah. uh, thing, so uh, what are the main uh, pauses that is actually required uh, for CG comps? The main the, passes? The light yes. Okay, so outside of the alpha channel? Uh, yes, outside of the alpha <laughs> channel. I mean, I mean, again, it, it, it varies from shot to shot. You can get many different passes, but essentially uh this would be a color pass here this would be a diffuse uh yeah. which is just a very base the very basic sort of uh layer without any of the reflections or without it's a basic sense of lighting but without any of the specular highlights uh you can get a reflection pass which is what this one is i believe uh this one is a shadow pass so that you can embellish work on the shadows <coughs> excuse me many times you will get uh, a spec pass, specular highlight pass, uh, which is essentially what this is. Um, so that's always a big one. And sometimes you get multiple spec passes. And then you can get an ID pass as well, this one here. So uh, you don't always get that. But again, if you want to just isolate certain areas of the model and affect their color or whatever, uh, you can use these. So yeah. um, I, don't know, if, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but... Cool, that's yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, so, uh, Jay, uh, do you think um, these pauses, like, uh, it's like uh, we have like some uh, pretty basic, like by default, some default uh, pauses that's been created by uh, lighting. So, do yeah. you think uh, this will change according to the uh, pipeline in, in every different company, or uh, it will follow the same, like in in all the companies, all all the VFX companies? Like well, the companies you work so far, so what are the differences you have seen in the uh, lighting process that you got? I, I mean, there's certain things that are just absolutely standard, uh, you know, reflection passes, uh, sorry, respect, diffuse lighting. Um, yeah, it's been my experience that it's been pretty sort of consistent. Okay. Uh, cool. But again, sometimes it can be, it can just be shot dependent. Um as you know, we have the ability to have little colored mats on many different things, uh, working on the expanse. It's very helpful in terms of if you just wanted to color correct a certain area of a spaceship or something like that. Uh, you don't always get those I I ID passes, uh, but for sure you are definitely typically getting, you're getting a spec pass, you're getting a reflection, you're getting a shadow, you're getting a diffuse. Cool, thanks Jay. Yeah. I'm going to ask uh, like a couple of questions to Jay and I'll just open the floor for Q&A so that you guys can ask questions directly to Jay. Let's see. So uh, Jay, uh, just want to ask you like a couple of questions. Okay. So uh, what was the most challenging work that uh, have you done? Oh boy, I've, ha I've had some doozies. Uh, I've had some interesting shots. The, the complexity of a shot can can can, um, uh, can involve several things. One of them is just the overall, uh, or how tough a shot is, how complex it is, all the elements, what's being asked of you, what you have to do with the shot. Uh, and the other thing can be the frame count. How long is the shot? Typically, a shot that I work on can be anywhere, on average, probably between 70 to 150 frames. Uh, in the summer, I, I worked on a shot on the Expanse that was in excess of 3,000 frames, and uh, <laughs> that was a challenge, I can tell you that. Um, 
So, and the other thing, of course, with that shot, it was interesting. It was um, it was a woman inside a spacesuit breathing. And so the the interesting challenge was not just the length of the shot. I had to fake breath coming out of her mouth and hitting her mask. Uh, the other thing I had to do was, and this is a rarity, I actually had to listen to the sound file so that all my breath outs, my breath hits would work in sync. Uh, and over 3,000 frames, uh, that's a lot of tedious work. So, I mean, if, if, if you're going to ask me what lately, what was the biggest challenge? That, that one, that's what I had nightmares over. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, you, you can have uh, shots pre- present to themselves many different challenges. Um, there could just be things going on in a shot as far as trying to track what's happening in a live action plate and accurately get a read of that and then mm-hmm. put an element in there. But uh, the one that comes to mind is that expanse shot, 3,000 frames. That was a challenge. I can see that you just remember it suddenly, like after my questions. <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. see your. <laughs> you can probably see me wincing. You can probably yeah. see the blood flowing into my eyeballs. Cool. Thanks, Jay. Um, so uh, I'm on to the next question. Sure. So, uh, how do you uh, motivate yourself as an artist? Well, you know, I find it kind of, um, how do I motivate myself? But I, you know, I play rock and roll. I listen to wear a t-shirt. No, uh, I, um, I kind of like, well, first of all, I love film. So that's important. So I'm just totally in the cinema, love film, love science fiction films. It's 10 years old when I saw Star Wars. So uh, I think I'm probably in the right area. Uh, and I kind of like the idea that shots in many ways are puzzles. It's a matter of problem solving. How am I gonna get from here to here to here? Here's your basic elements. Uh, How am I gonna make this thing look like it actually was shot with a camera and and, and, wasn't just a manipulation uh, of various pieces and elements? So I, I think I think part of it is it's always great to be able to bring some creativity into the shot. Occasionally a client will ask you to do something uh, I had a shot again on the expanse where I had to have arcing little bits of electricity um, that were sort of emanating out of a spacesuit, and they basically let me just go with that and come up with the look and everything, and they essentially proved it. So that was rewarding, being able to come up with stuff on your own. But I think the other part of it for me is just the the ability to problem solve, the ability to put a puzzle together. I think. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, uh, Jay. Uh, So one last question. Uh, So what do you think about the uh, future of this uh, CG and VFX industry? Well, you never know, right? (laughs) Uh, I think it's good. I've been working pretty steady now for a while, uh, but things change. Technology changes, right? There were guys doing things on films 30, 40 years ago, right? Building the building the Blade Runner set and the models and stuff. And and those jobs are extinct, right? So yeah. uh, it's it's always changing and you don't know if it's going to change, uh, how it's going to affect you. Um, but listen, I mean, there's no shortage of Marvel superhero films. Uh, people love big visual effect films. Uh, and certainly in our industry, a film doesn't even have to be a big Marvel special effects film uh, visual effects film to to need our work on it. We, I've worked on many films where you might not even know there was a visual effect. You know, a backdrop of somebody driving in a car. Uh, there's so many instances where something can be done um, artificially to change and improve or enhance a scene. So from that point of view, I mean, I'm not worried about running out of work anytime soon, but... Um, as we know, the industry is, you know, technology is changing and it's changing fast. So, uh, but yeah. so far, so good. Yeah, the virtual production and things, it's its changing the industry a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for your answers. Thank you so much, Jay, for your uh, time and uh, for the awesome uh, okay. demo. So we are looking forward uh, more sessions with you. Yeah, well, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks for your patiently answering all the questions. That's really inspiring. Thank you so much, Jay. Okay, great. Thank awesome. you, Jay. That was awesome. You're very welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for uh, checking it out, guys.